Thanks for inviting me. Um, this is joint work with Matt Jackson, and it's on network formation models. Um, so network formation shows up in a variety of ways in uh, different economic contexts. I just wanted to start by motivating it uh, with something close to what I do, which is development economics. So usually, um, the theory literature has spent a lot of time in this space. And the sorts of questions they ask is, in a world in which you know, villagers don't have access to formal uh, insurance markets, or they don't have access to commitment contracts, how do they organize themselves to share risk? And there's a number of theory models in this space. And it turns out that not all organizational structures of villagers actually generate efficient risk sharing. And the, especially when, for instance, Conrad and I want to share risk, the problem is if there's no commitment, he can run away. So it turns out you don't actually have these isolated relationships to share risk. What we do is we actually embed this in other relationships. So Conrad and I share risk, but we do it in the presence of Isaiah. So that way, if I renege on him, Isaiah can come and bash my head in. Right? So this is the sort of structure. Um, so, so more broadly, um, there are other contexts in which we care about network formation as well. If we think that people want to acquire information, they organize themselves paying costs to get the information. So you know, Bernard might invest heavily in gathering information. That means I'm not going to invest heavily. I'll just get information from him. And this will give particular configurations of the social structure. Okay? So the, the core motivation of this project is to think about how we can develop models that will allow us to test hypotheses from the theory and or do counterfactual policy analysis. Um, so what do I mean by counterfactual policy analysis? You might think in the risk sharing um, uh, arena, uh, we, we've estimated some model based on preferences of how, how villagers organize to share risk. And now you want to know what happens if there's financial deepening, if you've brought a bank to town. And depending on how you specify that model, it's more ambitious than what I'm going to talk about today. But, but the goal would be to say something about how the network would likely change. And that would be great to understand things about institutional design. So the four things we want then are, one, we want estimable, feasibly estimable network formation models. We want these models to exhibit link dependencies. We know, for instance, that it might be more likely that you link to a friend's friend. Uh, we know, like my example with risk sharing, it's likely that these relationships are embedded in other structures. We want there to be good statistical properties. And I'll be precise in what I mean by that. But basically, if you have a large network, you want to be more and more accurate about your parameter estimate. And it would be nice if you sort of had random utility foundations. So these are the kinds of things we want. OK. Um, what are the difficulties? So it would be great if the typical data set a empirical researcher faces is they have a number of networks. Then, then life would be pretty easy. Uh, but usually, you have one draw. You have one large network with, say, 200, 500, 1,000 uh, agents. And, and that's the observation you're looking at. And so there are really two extremes here, just like in one time series or one you know, spatial data set. On the one hand, if you really had full independence, if there are n people, you have n choose two potential links in the world where this is undirected. So, so, so you have a lot, of, a lot of information there, right? But on the entire other extreme, and you can write you know, theoretical models to generate this, maybe if Azim and I are linked, that means that no one else in this entire room should get linked at all. And so you essentially just have one draw, and you can't really say anything at all, right? So, 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 so there are really two extremes here. And so we want to sort of generate separability in the model so we can actually say something about the network structure in a meaningful way. Um, the other thing I thought I'd do is just show you what data looks like, at least pictorially. So this is uh, data from one of our Indian village networks. There's like 150 households here, and every line indicates whether or not they share risk with another household in the village. Okay? And you have lots of covariates. What I did here is I colored it by cast. So you can see, for instance, that while this graph sort of fragments into two major pieces and really like about four smaller pieces, and you can sort of predict that based on cast or subcast, there's a lot of heterogeneity in position even within that. And we think a lot of it has to do with some sort of strategic foundation. So it'd be nice to try to capture these structures. So, so basically what we're going to think about is we're going to think about a world in which we sort of have, we're going to think about an asymptotic sequence where we have one draw along the sequence that we observe, a graph. And we want to recover the parameters driving the, the, the distribution over graphs. And obviously, without any restriction on preferences or the action space of individuals, we can't say anything. Because if you think about it from the context of Conrad's paper yesterday, you know, if the probability of, like, if my utility of matching with him depends on whether or not Bernard matches with Max and a number of other things, you're in a lot of trouble. Right? So we're going to have to make a lot of assumptions to start to chop this into pieces. Um, the other thing I wanted to do, since it's probably literature a little bit far away from most people here, is just give you a sense of 
what people have been working on and what approaches there are and what the limitations are. And you'll sort of see ours as well. Um, so first, and I'll discuss this model in detail, most models that are used in the literature are either demonstrably not consistent or we don't know if they are consistent for a large draw. Uh, and I'll explain what that means in a second. But, but usually what they do then is they specify a model and um, a lot of times they do uh, some sort of Bayesian estimation, they recover a parameter, and it's not obvious that if you sort of had a, la uh, like a larger graph, you'd actually have more certainty about the actual parameter you're estimating. Um, this, so, so I'll give you uh, the main example that's used in the stats and sociology and CS literature. Um, it's called uh, an exponential random graph. Um, it doesn't mean anything more than just they specify the probability of drawing a graph is going to be a function of a vector of sufficient statistics, right? Just like the exponential family. And usually the sufficient statistics they use are a vector of counts of subgraph in the graph. And there are two motivations for this. One motivation comes from uh, a result called the Hammersley-Clifford theorem that basically says that if you have a, uh, if you have a, a, a matrix that represents dependency, so, so something that represents a mark of random field, you can it turns out you can always write the distribution generating that in this form for some vector of sufficient statistics. It doesn't say what. So in some sense, it's vacuous, but, but, but that is sort of an original motivation for why people started writing this in this form. And for historical reasons, people invested a lot in developing the software to do this. And now you have a number of people running these routines trying to estimate something that looks like this. Okay? So, so, and, and usually they have data like this. They want to spit out some betas. Okay. Um, the second problem with the literature, both with this and um, other models, is that estimation sort of becomes infeasible or, or, or difficult. Um, I'll be precise in what I mean about infeasible later on. But, but basically, if you look at this expression, it involves a denominator, which sums over all possible graphs, which is 2 to the n choose 2, which isn't small. And so in that case, you can't do that. So you want to do something like MCMC. Then a question arises, do we know that the MCMC actually mixes in polynomial time, or does it mix in exponential time? And the answer is most people, for most things they write down, don't check, because it's really hard. But recently, there were results in the math literature that showed that for a lot of these models, they mix in exponential time, unless all the links basically look independent, which is depressing, because then you could have just done you know, logits by all n choose two pairs. So, 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 so it's not. It's not um, so, so it could be hard to do, and a lot of times it won't work. Um, the third thing is that there's sort of a promising set of new techniques uh, that people have developed, um, but they apply for dense graphs. So what does that mean? So, so for example, this is based on a model that, came, that Holland and Leinhardt, Leinhardt wrote in, about like in 1980s. Um, but Chatterjee, Diaconis, and Sly showed the following. So if you imagine that the probability, so just imagine that there's a vector of fixed effects, right? So every individual is assigned some beta, and, and this influences the probability they link to anyone else. And so you can think about the probability i and j link as just pij in this, in this form. So, so they show that it turns out you can actually estimate this consistently in this sense, uh, which sort of isn't obvious you could do ex ante, but they actually do some work and show it. The problem is the networks they describe have to be dense. What do I mean by dense? Um, so the way the argument works is it says, look, they're n unknown, so, but I know like, for every individual in the network how many links they have. Right? I know Stefan has three. I know Conrad has 10. Except the numbers I'm saying won't work because they're low and they're constant. The numbers you actually need to say are Stefan has three times n. Conrad has 10 times n. That's sort of the rates they need. Because you need to say that everyone's sort of the number of links they're assigned is very close to the expected number of links that should have been assigned. And if that's the case, they can do this, and otherwise they can't. And so the techniques they've developed work really well for dense graphs, which is great, except if you remember this picture I showed you, um, the very fact that you can see anything and it's not just a hairball means that it's a sparse graph. Because of the n choose two potential links, most of them don't exist. And so the techniques don't work for that. Um, okay. Uh, and the last one is there are these nice techniques based on spatial methods. Um, and, and they build on either unconsciously or consciously, but I'll make the link anyway, these things called random geometric graphs in the network's literature. Um, 
So, so it's best to do this in pictures. So imagine, imagine that this is, you know, things live in this square. And asymptotically, we're going to sort of expand the square. So this is going to be increasing domain asymptotics. But, and then, you know, there are radii around the nodes. And nodes can link to, you know, say with high probability to other nodes within that radii and low probability to others. And in fact, uh, most of the models I've seen actually would say there's a cutoff. If you're far enough away and it's some finite cutoff, I won't link to you at all. Okay? In that case, you get graphs that look like this. But they have the following properties. So if you imagined everyone numbered on a line, okay? so, one to, so just instead of two dimensions, imagine one dimension, then this is what the adjacency matrix looks like. So what is this? It's a representation of an n by n uh, matrix with entries 1 or 0 indicating whether or not a node is linked to another node. Okay? Here, black means high probability of being linked, say, and white means not linked. And basically, the structures that this sort of model results in looks like this, which, which, is, which is great. Um, but, but most of the data that we look at doesn't have this black diagonal feature. So, so what they're able to show is that under conditions like this, um, sort of the, the statistics you might use to estimate the parameters form a mixing random field. But, but that comes from this block diagonal structure. And so there's a lot of, so, so in this context, someone here sort of by definition can't link to someone here. Okay? But we see sparse graphs where there's actually sort of mass distributed everywhere. Okay. So what we're going to try to do is develop some new models that um, extend the workhorse model a little bit. I, I don't know that extend is the right word. We'll see what the right word is later. Um, that emphasize subgraphs as the object of interest. And this has a motivation. If you look at the theory literature network, a lot of the emphasis is on how groups will organize themselves, whether or not relationships need to be embedded. And the resulting network is sort of going to be a projection of these like, subgraph decisions. Um, and under certain assumptions on how re uh, sort of relatively sparse these different subgraphs are, these estimators are going to be consistent and asymptotically normally distributed. Um, it turns out they're very feasible to estimate because this essentially boils down to counting and regression, which is sort of nice. Um, and we'll also show that it generates graphs sort of consistent with the data. The, um, the example I'll show you sort of in depth uses our own data from India, but it's not hard to see that the way the model is structured, you could take, for instance, Marcus Mobius's uh, Harvard Networks data and do the same trick, and it would probably fit particularly well. Um, and they have some, and, and you know, I want to put caveats here because we're going to have to make a lot of assumptions to get things here. Uh, but, but some micro foundations, and at least as good as those in the present literature. OK. So if you forget everything else I say, um, this summarizes our approach. So this is the graph that the uh, researcher sees. And this is what we want the researchers to see. So, so here what you can see is that we view this as a projection of subgraphs of groups of triangles, which are highlighted in green, and then subgraphs of links that aren't embedded in triangles, highlighted in gray. OK? And so, so that's, that's sort of it in a nutshell. And so that observation says that you can think about preference over high order structures. You can think about probabilities of these different things forming. This is called a hypergraph in the literature. And then the projection is really what, what we get in the data, and that's what we're interested in. And so, you know, and, and th there's a sense in which the fact that, say, Conrad, me, and Isaiah are all friends means that we'll go have a beer together. But if I'm friends with Conrad, but from a very different social group, and Conrad and Isaiah are friends, but in a very different social group, and, and so on, that has very different meaning than we're all jointly friends, or we're all jointly sharing risk, or so on and so forth. And so, so there's a physical difference in some sense. And what we're going to say, essentially, is that the, me and Conrad becoming friends bilaterally, and then him and Isaiah becoming friends bilaterally, and Isaiah and me becoming friends bilaterally has to be rare relative to the events where the three of us get together to do something. That's, that's it. And th that's in, in a nutshell. Everything else is just counting. So I could probably end here. Um, OK. So, so to give you, to give you uh, some examples of what the preference foundations sort of need to be like to get models like this. Um, let me just give you sort of three distinct examples. Um, and then I'm not going to come back to them. I'm then going to talk about counting after that. Uh, the first is dy dynamic myopic revision. So, so, so you can imagine 
um, that the utility of living in a graph with a characteristic vector x is basically I look at all the subgraphs I'm a part of, and I sum up my payoffs of being parts of these various subgraphs that you care about under the model, where that could depend on the characteristics of the people in your subgraph and all this stuff. Right? So there's this additive separability we're assuming. We're going to use this, something that's very standard from Jackson Wolinsky on, which is sort of pairwise stability with transfers. So basically, uh, if we are linked, that means that the sum of our utilities is higher than the sum if we weren't linked, and vice versa. And it turns out that if you make these two assumptions together, there's a potential function. Okay? The potential function is just a function such that the difference in my utility when I do and don't have this link can be represented by the difference of just f of having this link and having not this link. Okay? And if you care what the potential function is, you just want to like sum up over i, and then you're going to get a 2 coefficient in front of the v for sort of me and Asim. Okay. Um, then just imagine that people sort of meet. So in every period they, they, they meet, uh, there's sort of positive mass on people meeting. It could depend on history. None of that really matters, actually. Um, and so there's a result that sort of originally was proved by Carter Butts and then extended by Mele and further extended by us. But basically, the resulting invariant distribution is going to remember that funny exponential random graph form. It turns out you'll get an exponential random graph where the potential function is actually the sufficient statistic. So, yes? Would you think of the subgraph as exogenous or would this also something that's going to happen? Does that make sense? No, so I haven't been clear. So, sorry, what do you mean? No, I just mean like, so do we think, so do we think that the subgraph is also going to be formed by decisions made by the agents? Or that is given and then the other connections are going to be formed? Does that make sense? Ah, OK, I understand. OK, no, so, so all of it is. So, so, so OK, yes, so I'm just uh, bad at presenting. So, um, so the graph. A subgraph is just some collection of nodes and links within it. So this is all part of the decision. I'm just saying that you can think about a model in which um, you can think about a model in which you care about some of these structures and not others. And then you project down, you get that, and that's all we're counting. Lars? So um, in terms of patterns, one Interesting question, like on a financial network, when will a clearinghouse show up and then, which a lot of people interact with a single person or say in a village maybe there's a single lender that's interacting with everybody as, as, as possible the connections. Is that included in the, and this is a possibility or just ruled out? Yeah, that's a, yeah. So actually things like that will cause huge problems. Um, it turns out in our village data it doesn't look like that, but that's exactly the sort of thing that'll, I'll, I'll highlight that when I show you what we need, but that's what'll screw it up. Um, for two reasons, actually, not even one. So, so w one reason is that that's just dense by definition if you're connected to most people. But the other reason it'll kill it is it turns out if you look at a structure where you're the center and you have many links that just radiate out, combinatorially that can be, you know, if you, that, that could be just a link. That could be a link with a branch off it. So there's lots of things that show up there. So those are centralized markets inside this network are going to create some issues now. Yeah, it'll struggle there. That's right. Yeah. So what about we have a graph that constitutes one community, that's one tree in our group, and another community, and there are intermediaries in the middle? That's, that's less of a problem. But that's not a tree in group, right? The intermediaries are not going to be a tree in no, 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 there's nothing sacred about a triangle. I, I'm, so let me back up. Okay. So I don't care about, I, I, I do not care about triangles at all. Okay? Triangles are motivated here because, yeah, 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 so, 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 so. So, so the reason triangles are here basically for two reasons. One, it turns out like if you write down the risk sharing model and think about the renegotiation proof stable equilibria, it turns out you need like interwoven triangles in a particular way. That's this embedding thing. But more generally, it's, it's like the minimal subgraph I need to make my point that's beyond a link. That's why I'm going to talk about links and triangles today. I don't actually care about triangles. You could have like bunnies or something. Now, now Lars's example of stars totally screws us up because I'll make precise why it screws us up. But your example is OK. We, we, we will cover that. OK. But how about if they have multiple stars or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 star, the, the star path will screw us up. And, and, and it'll screw up most of the, uh, it'll screw up, the, the literature doesn't handle stars well. Another one, here's a static version of this that was dynamic, but you have payoffs by subgraph. You know, you can think about mutual consent. So everyone want, has to want to do it. Otherwise, you don't form the subgraph. There's some meeting process. Pairs meet. This can all depend on covariates, whatever. There's some shocks, and then you know, under some sparsity assumptions, you can recover those parameters, and the distribution will look something like this. Where now this is a new f; it's not the f from the previous slide. Um, and here's a different one, actually, which in some sense, um, so you could think about like 
a search intensity. So agents put in costly search to form partners to produce things. So I need a partner to go chop down a tree, but I need three partners to go you know, push my cart to the vegetable vending location or something. And, and um, it turns out that you can put in efforts into making different subgroups of people. And my success in this can be stochastic. And, and sort of th this is sort of a, a standard search model game that's in the literature. But this gives rise to subgraphs with different frequencies, depending on how you parameterize this as well. So the, the, these all give rise to different stories where cliques of various size arise. Or, but, but this is to sort of convince you that there are stories behind this. What I'm going to do now is sort of leave this and talk a lot about counting. Okay? And I, when I talk about triangles, I don't only care about triangles. It's just it's a useful example. But you're right. It does have some meaning for risk sharing. OK. Um, so, so let me start with this. So this is, this, is, this is what I'm going to talk about, a simple example, then subgraph generated models, and some illustrations. Um, so let me start with these exponential random graph models. There's this is huge literature that's looked at it. And I, I gave you one motivation. Um, let me give you a very simple example. So, so imagine that I'm a researcher who is specified for whatever reason that I think the probability of a graph should depend on the number of ice, the sufficient statistic vectors, the number of isolates, people that aren't connected, the number of links, and the number of triangles. That's just the vector I've picked. OK? Um, as I pointed out, this denominator is, is, is huge, right? So this is a problem, and so people are going to have to do MCMC procedures. OK. Um, so, so as I mentioned, a recent literature has pointed out basically. So, so the practitioners have noticed for a while that these things screw up once in a while. But it's sort of a mystery. So you have this series of papers saying, how can I fix it a little bit? How can I fix it a little bit? But um, Bamidi and uh, Sarf Chatterjee and Prasidi Akonis showed in different papers that essentially um, mixing time is polynomial only when networks it's a weird condition, but basically, it's all the edges basically look independent. Okay? Um, so they sort of formalized why the MCMC fails. However, they only were able to prove it in the dense case, okay? not in the sparse case. And I told you, we live in the sparse case. So I owe you something to tell you it doesn't work in the sparse case. So that's what I'm going to show you now. I'm going to show you a simulation. Um, so, so the simulation I'm going to show you is a world where you have 50 nodes, 20 isolates, 45 links, and 10 triangles. Okay. Um, I could do this two ways. I can generate the graph stochastically, or I can actually just pin graphs with those exact counts, in which case the parameter that's estimated from the chain shouldn't really move around much at all. Um, and so what is this figure? The actual value of the parameter should mean nothing to you, and the fact that it moves around should mean nothing to you because you don't know the scale. But the two red lines you see are the median uh, confidence interval. The, or the one red line, which is two of them. So basically, uh, OK. <laughs> so that's what I want you to see. So, so, so to interpret this, if you take the estimated parameter and you simulate out the chain of graphs, well, it turns out sometimes they have this like degenerate graph. But you know they get about 20 so it, it, it isolates. So they're not doing badly there. Um, so then you can look at the links parameter. And again, you know they, they, they have awesome coverage. Um, <laughs> but, but if you look at the graph they generate, they have about 350 links. OK, but I, how many links did I have? I think I had 45, right? So it's, it's off by a lot. And if you look at triangles, parameters all over the place, not obvious what that means. It's living in a place where you have about 2,000 links. So they kind of like get stuck at some overly dense place. And so this, take this as evidence that even in the sparse case, it has some perverse properties. OK, so conclusion is that you sort of have unstable estimates of the parameter, unreasonably uh, drawn chains, and really bad inference suggested based on sort of taking the slope of the supposed likelihood, log likelihood at that spot. OK. So, so what are we going to do? The, the first observation is, look, there are a lot of Gs, but obviously there are fewer possible statistics. And we're sort of living in a weird space here. So why not just look at the sufficient statistic space? So if you look at this model, I mean, this is just the standard thing. You can sum up over the sort of equivalence class, all graphs with the same sufficient statistic. And you can sum the numerator. And now you sort of have a probability distribution over the space of sufficient statistics. And these weights, these reference distributions, are what? They're the counting measure. They basically tell you how many graphs there are with this many links and this many triangles. OK. Now, it's sort of well known for many of these models. Like if you put triangles in, like if you ask this question on math overflow, people can't, like serious people can't tell you how to compute this. It's an open question in math. And so, like, you, it's not like you can collapse to this and then you know what n is. But my point is there's nothing sacred about n either. 
Like, I didn't tell you a great micro foundation for why you care about n. And in fact, the next model I'll tell you is going to give you a different reference distribution. So the next observation is, look, I could have put any reference distribution. I don't really care if I wanted to live with models of this form. And maybe some of them actually recover estimability. Okay? And so that's the direction we're going to go. So, so, so the point is that in general, you can think about, so in principle, this isn't a complete model. So think about conditional on the sufficient statistics you graph you generate a graph at uniform at random with those sufficient statistics. And so we're going to look for models where you have micro foundations. And it turns out you might generate other k's not equal to n. You can actually estimate things very easily, actually by counting. And they sort of follow the intuitions that the users of this wanted to use in the first place. Um, and again, just to remember, s, the statistic vector, can encode lots of things, links, cliques, stars. But too many of these will cause troubles. Um, Friends in common, they can encode covariates. Right? There's nothing that limiting about them. Um, subgraph models. So I'm going to go to a complete different direction now and then come back to this. So the two things that economic networks look like, in my view, are first, there's a lot of interdependency between links, but it's mostly empty. So what this really means is that there's a lot of relative interdependency between links. So most people have something that looks like order constant or order log number of links, something like this. But, but, and, and a non-trivial share of these are friends in common. But by and large, it's an empty graph. And so we're going to try to really exploit this in doing the model. Um, and so our subgraph generated model is sort of going to work like this. Nature forms subgraphs of each type with some probability. They may intersect, they may overlap, and we observe the resulting graph and we infer the probabilities. And so pictorially, you have nodes, some triangles are born, some links are born. And look, that generated an extra triangle. And you have your resulting graph. OK. Um, so more formally, the model consists of a vector, a finite vector of pre-specified, call these like canonical graphs, g1 through gk. And we're going to call, say that they're nicely ordered. Uh, what does that mean? They're nicely ordered if first, oh, the primes came up top. They were supposed to be on the Ls. That's bad. OK, so they're nicely ordered if first g1 isn't a subset of g2, g2 isn't a subset of g3, and so on and so forth. And moreover, when I look at the graph and if I count an object, I haven't already counted it by it being part of a subgraph previously counted. OK, that's a mouthful. So if we take our example with links and triangles, g1 is triangles, and g2 are all links that already weren't part of some triangle. Right? So if you look at my picture here, that's why they're green, and then they're dashed gray. So this is your nicely ordered um, set. OK. And so then you have a vector of parameters uh, that, that'll sort of ch change with n along this triangular array, because you need it to, to preserve sparsity. And you could do it with covariates as well. So you could think about these as parametric functions of x that depend on some parameters. Um, and the formation is going to be type 1 subgraph form with probabilities p1 or p1 of x type 2, type 3, type 4, and so on and so forth. So, so the problem is exactly this, right? We, we get into this world where you have stuff that's generated on accident. And so we just want to see if that happens too often. Um, so, so you can define generating classes. So for every canonical subgraph, there's a class you can generate. Uh, there, there are a bunch of classes you can, ge you can uh, sort of enumerate that can generate this on accident. So if you take the case of links and triangles, a triangle can be generated by having three triangles on accident. Right, one forming each of the sides of the triangle you're interested in. You could have a triangle, a triangle, and a link. You could have three links, or you can have two links and a triangle. There's four ways to accidentally get the subgraph that you're actually counting as a, as a true triangle. And so the system is relatively sparse if sort of the intuitive thing holds. If the share of accidentally generating this to the share of truly generating this goes to zero. So, so the real question isn't really about defining this. It's about thinking about the model and asking if the rates that are implied on the parameters by this admit the sort of data that we look at. Okay? And so that's what I want to show you next. So if you take the links and triangles example, consider the case where a triangle is generated by three other triangles on accident. So, so, there's sort of n, so, so that happens with n cubed times p cubed probability. Because you need each of those three triangles to be generated. That's where the p cubed comes from. And every triangle, right? you've already pinned two nodes. That's the edge. And then you just can have a free choice of the other nodes. So there's the order n of them. So it's n cubed times p cubed. 
and divided by the probability is truly generated, which is this p. And this gives you some order restriction. It tells you that the probability of seeing a triangle has to be smaller than 1 over n to the 3 halves. Okay. Um, what does that mean? That means that on the, a given node can be on part of something that's just under square root of n triangles. That's a lot. That's, I mean, so if you do, OK, I'm not going to do square roots in my head. But that, that, that's, that's an order that's much bigger than what we actually see in the data. Usually, when people think about sparse models, it's order constant they're worried about. So giving us something that's you know, 1 over uh, like n to the 1 half minus delta, that's great. That covers a lot of stuff. Um, then maybe what it does is it rules out links. So you can go and check. Uh, you know, it shouldn't be the case that three links dwarf the probability of a triangle. But again, that allows sort of order slightly less than you know, root n links per person. So, so that's a huge number of links and triangles allowed, allowed uh, along the sequence. And to make this concrete, so here's um, that paper by Leader, Mobius, Rosenblatt, and Doe. There's a Harvard social network with about 4,000 students. Um, they have pretty good coverage, actually, so there isn't a huge sampling problem here. The average number of links per person is about 8, and the average percent of one's friends that are themselves friends is about 8%. If this, the rates that we picked were like 3 over n squared or 2 over n for these two parameters, you would have average number of links is 8, and the average clustering is 10.7%. So you can easily sort of cover the cases in the, the literature. So then the, the result is actually pretty straightforward. This is you know, essentially just looking at uh, binomials. Um, so these parameters are uh, consistent, and they're asymptotically normally distributed. And uh, uh, it's uh, very easy to add discrete covariates, though you have to be careful because things can blow up in terms of dimensionality. And it's also straightforward to add continuous covariates as well. And you can sort of ensure yourself that you can consistently estimate the parameters that go into the probability function. That's a little bit more involved, but, but you can do it. OK. Um, so I started off with these exponential random graph models that I summed to the space of statistics. So is there a link from this to that? Um, the answer is yes, and it motivates very specific reference distributions. So if you thought about the probability of a subgraph being given by the PLs that we just saw, then just invert the log odds, and that'll give you what the sort of the parameter should be in the exponential form. Right? Not very surprising. And then the reference distribution implied is essentially the probability of seeing a, graph, a subgraph of type L is sort of n choose the number of nodes involved in that subgraph, choose the number of uh, subgraphs you actually observe. That's your reference distribution. So it's like how many possible triangles are there? Choose how many triangles you observe. That, that, that's it. That's what you're looking at. Uh, right? And that's, that's, this is, there's not anything deep here. It's rewriting a a binomial. But it's just observing that if you take very natural emergence foundations, you don't end up with the ends in the literature. You can get other things as well. Right? And this is a pretty reasonable generative model. So the other thing I wanted to point out is this is very, very easy to implement. So like, if the researcher has a graph and a vector of covariates, instead of doing really complicated stuff, so let's just say they cared about cliques of four, triangles, and links, and they cared about covariates. Well, you collect all of the, I mean, there are issues with managing the data, so you have to sort of randomly sample from them and be clever and do some sort of important sampling. But you essentially run a regression, checking how many four cliques exist or not as a function of covariates, get your parameters, and they're shown to be consistent. And then you just delete everything you just used. And now you run a regression of whether or not there are triples on covariates, and then get your parameters, delete everything you just used, and then run everything on all remaining pairs. And so this is a loop you can do in Stata. This isn't particularly hard. Um, and so that's pretty different from what people have been doing to estimate models that are not so different from this. Um, okay. So finally, what I want to give you is just two quick illustrations. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use our network data from a detailed study in India uh, across a number of villages. And I'm going to estimate two models. Um, one is I'm going to look at the probability of a link existing based on a large number of covariates. And in the other, I'm just going to use a four-parameter model, where you, you, you know, a link is defined to be close or far if we're beyond or within the median geographic distance, and we're of the same cast. And similarly, it's, a triangle is close or far. It's close if we're all of the same cast, and we're all within the median geographic distance. So we're going to run a race. And 
And, and once I estimate these, I'm going to just randomly generate 100 networks from these parameters for every village. And then um, what, what I'm going to, so what this table shows you is column one is the data. So these are a bunch of different moments. I'm just going to talk about two. Col column one is the data. Column two shows you the link-based model where you threw in lots of covariates. And columns three and four show you various specifications of these subgraph models. The two I'm going to focus on this. The reason is this tells you the percentage of my friends that are themselves friends. And this is the sort of network economics motivated notion of how thick a graph is. Almost every network model tells you the first eigenvalue is the right moment of the data. So those are the two I'm going to focus on. And so there's about you know 9% clustering in the data. Even with all these covariates, including cast and GPS and all of that, you only get 1% from the, from the link space model. But when you do the subgraph models, you can get things that are much closer to the ballpark. The first eigenvalue is 5.5. It's much lower in the link-based model, even with lots of covariates. Um, it's, it's considerably closer when you use the subgraph-based model. And if you think, well, I'm not showing you any standard errors, here's just like the raw plots, where this is data, this is the simulations, the blue lines, the 45-degree lines. And these stuff along the 45-degree lines are the two subgraph-based models. And all the dots below are the two models based on covariates with links. And you know, for every village, it does a pretty good job of. OK. Um, I'll skip the other one, but it looks like that as well. Mm. OK. So, so the last thing I wanted to end with is an illustration of how you might use this in a context that's a little bit different, but, but I thought was interesting. Um, so caste is a big deal in India. And it turns out there's a lot of social segregation because People of one caste are unwilling to actually transact with people of other castes, in particular, possibly in public. And so what this can do is it can generate fragmentation in the graph, which then has spillovers to how people engage in social learning or you know, what sort of opportunities they are able to come by, labor market search, stuff like this. And so we're going to ask a question, which is, is it the case that you're differentially less likely to form a link with someone of another caste when you're embedded in another relationship? Okay. And sort of everything we've done until now gave the formalism to make this a legit exercise. Like in principle, you could have gone and counted, but this tells you why you could go and count. Okay? Um, I'm not going to go through this, but there's one more thing where preferences come up here. It turns out you need more consents for three people to get along than two people to get along. So you actually have to adjust for this. You have to adjust for the fact that there are three consents going on when you have three people deciding to form a link versus two people in the case of a double. And so. What you see here is this is the 45 degree line. This tells you the relative frequency, which is adjusted for the consent, of having a link to someone of a different caste versus a link of having someone of the same caste. And this is the ratio of the frequency of having a triangle with people of different castes to the triangle with people of the same caste, adjusting for this consent <coughs> issue from the utility functions. And basically, 45, if everything was on the 45 degree line, this means that there's no difference. So there isn't this sort of stigma. But by and large, stuff falls below it. Um, and more interestingly, though I don't want to put you too much because I don't think we could say this statistically, um, if you look at places that are closer to the 50-50, like one cast versus another, those are the places where you really have a lot of stigma. In places where they're on the fringe, which are the red dots, where there's like 10% versus 90%, then there, there's sort of no difference in frequency. So it seems, and this is a phenomenon they've documented in other contexts, like in education contexts with blacks and whites and stuff like this. So in sum, um, I think the literature is still young. There's a lot of estimation challenges. And our hope here was to point out if you work with subgraphs directly, you can simplify estimation a lot. Thanks. OK. Um, I have not been looking forward to this, okay. <laughs> uh, because it's always, um, uh, you don't like to come in public and say, uh, you know, I have a lot of trouble understanding a paper, uh, because then uh, I may look bad, or, um, or the author won't like it if I uh, don't understand it. But uh, um, I first heard a version of this a couple of years ago, everyone came through on the job market uh, to Northwestern. and. Uh, I had difficulty understanding the paper then. And then two things have happened subsequently. It's been, I'm not sure if it's two or three years. Uh, one is you would expect the paper's gone through revisions, so expect it should be more understandable and um, transparent over time. On the other hand, I'm two or three years older, so my ability to understand anything 
drops with time. Uh, I think on net, I'm in about the same situation I was a couple of years ago. <laughs> uh, so what I did, uh, I really, I mean, this t the topic, of course, is uh, very interesting to me. I wanted to, um, uh, I really wanted to understand it. Um, but I started reading it, and I found I had lots of questions, was making comments to myself on the uh, PDF. And so I decided what I would do is uh, give you a lot of quotes from just the first two sections of the paper, because that's as far as I got, actually. And uh, so it's, it's not on particulars of the math so much as on some more basic issues, and um, see what's underneath. OK, so right at the beginning, uh, just a couple of preludes at first. Uh, a researcher, this is, quote, uh, um, what Arun wrote is in plain text, and then what are, my questions are in italics, um, that endogeneity, endogeneity of interactions often makes network estimation essential. So, so as a background question, for those of you who know this literature at all, there, there really have been two literatures that have arisen in parallel without that much interaction. One is the literature on network um, formation, description of networks. And uh, the other is the literature on uh, what happens inside particular networks. It's the second literature, of course, that I, I know uh, much better. That's the literature I've, I've worked in. I haven't worked on uh, network formation, per se. Um, somehow, these literatures have not interacted with one another as much as they should. It, it has been observed uh, that they need more interaction. Uh, Brian Graham has a new um, uh, as a draft paper that's going to come out in the annual review of economics where he makes that point and I think it's correct. So that, that's a, uh, so, I, so I write here, for what purposes is estimation of a model of network formation essential? I'm not going to try to answer it, but there's some questions clearly for which it is and some for which it isn't. Okay, the second thing, the by the way, I want to take a minute on that. I was actually scribbling notes to myself as Arun was talking. Why does the literature, and what I mean by the literature, I should say, why, uh, particularly the graphs that we see, these very pretty graphs, describe a network as a set of binary links rather than as more general social interactions? I've been seeing these uh, graphs for a long, long time. Uh, Arun couldn't pronounce his name, but it was Sam Leinhart. And he was my colleague at Carnegie Mellon way back in the mid-1970s. So I, these, there, there were these mathematical sociologists doing uh, uh, network theory uh, way, way back then. So I've been seeing these graphs for a long time. And uh, the graphs look um, very general and complex, but it, it, it really occurs to me that they uh, actually um, omit a lot of the uh, richness of the information that Arun was talking about. So let me just talk about the uh, links and the triangles. Um, in the way, structurally, the way Arun was talking about links and triangles, they're, they're really different phenomena. Two people can form a link between one and the other. And of course, it could be a directed link versus an adirected link. That wasn't showing up on his grasp, but that's an issue. Or it could be that you only form a social interaction among three people, and there will be nothing at all existing if there's only two. Now, it turns out on these graphs, in which you saw plenty of them, and I've been seeing these things for 40 years, you cannot tell whether you have three binary pairs or one triangle. You know, the, 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 just the graphical representation doesn't tell you whether it's three binary pairs or, or one triangle. Um, in terms of the economics, in term, uh, it may be entirely different uh, phenomena, but it doesn't show up. And then I was thinking about the data. The data that's collected are generally on binary links. If you go something like the ad health, the, the data sets that are used, I don't know of any data set that, that collects data on triangles. Usually, you, you ask people for a list of friends. And it seems to me that to get um, a hold of structural differences between uh, links and triangles, never mind anything more complex, one would have to have data that would actually ask about uh, these things. Okay, They don't exist. That immediately creates an identification question that if you don't, if the data are not telling you what are three binary links versus one triangle, then the only way you're going to be able to do inference on this is make some very, very strong assumptions because it's not there in the data. So that was just, I scribbled that to myself, you know, just as he was talking. Uh, so that's one thing. A second thing is the graphical presentation, and I've seen so many of them over the years, I say again, um, they're static. If you're thinking about networks, you should be thinking about evolution of networks. We talk about, net, about the links forming or the triangles forming, or whatever they may be, but they may also be dissolving. So there's going to be some dynamic to these networks. None of that shows up 
here. And in fact, it's kind of odd to me that the literature is all about network formation and not on uh, network dissipation. So there should be uh, a general uh, dynamic to these networks, and, and that's not in there as well. So, uh, so these are some, uh, just some background issues that uh, are occurring to me. OK, so now I go on. And a quote here. Uh, this is, again, still in the beginning, very beginning of the paper. Uh, we talk about the exponential random graph models. And uh, he writes, these models have come under fire because the mathematic maximum likelihood estimator of the models may not be computationally feasible nor consistent. And software may provide inaccurate parameter estimates. And, and I find myself, I just keep, the first time I ever heard this paper, uh, Arun's with Matt Jackson, or is how in the world does one estimate a model of network generation from observation of one network? I mean, just how, how is that conceptually possible unless one makes some very, very strong uh, micro assumptions about the network formation process? And I think most of you know I'm not a time series person, but uh, the analogy is very clear with time series analysis. And, uh, and, and this point has been made repeatedly, I think, among people in talks over wine and beer, usually, rather than you know, formal discussions, that if we, uh, in doing time series analysis, if we observe we have a stochastic process, and there is, even if we observe minus infinity to plus infinity, you're just observing one sample path of that stochastic process. And of course, we don't even observe that. We observe a finite uh, subsample path from you know, one realization of the stochastic process. You can't get anywhere in time series analysis unless you put an awful lot of structure on the stochastic process that allows you to make inference from that very, very limited amount of data. Now, these network models are far more complex than what goes on in the time series literature. They're not easier. They're, they're far more complex than what's going on in time series literature. So the, one would have to start, well, I think, with very strong assumptions to get anywhere with observation of one network. Well, if one only observes one network, what is meant by consistent estimation? Okay, So let me come back to that, because I still don't understand what's meant by consistent estimation. Um, I should say, in terms of the uh, cases in which you can get somewhere, Arun talked about, what do you call it, um, uh, block diagonal, OK? Block diagonal things, those are easy, OK? Uh, and because then you actually do have um, essentially pseudo-independent observations. Uh, you just hit the blocks are independent, and you do the asymptotics as the number of blocks goes to infinity. Uh, so, th so that's not the real uh, problem. The real problem is when you don't have the blocks. L let me connect this with another literature. Although I have not worked on network formation, I have been thinking for some time, and I've written a little bit about the analysis of randomized experiments you know, on networks. And there are a lot of people who have been worrying about this. And here you have precisely the same problem. Okay. So we have the traditional assumption analysis of randomized experiments is of uh, individualistic response, you know, non-interference. Um, there, there, there are movements away from that in, in just in the last seven or eight years. There are papers in JASA and other on, on block diagonal uh, analysis of randomized experiments in block diagonal settings. But those aren't the, where the real problems arise. Um, if you have one connected world, then what do you do with randomized experiments? That's, 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 there's a lot of connection between that and the problem in this paper. OK. OK, so then he goes on and says this is what they're going to do. Uh, then he talks about the uh, exponential uh, random graph models. Okay, he says you have to encompass the uh, network as a whole, but uh, maybe not, given what I say. Uh, but then we get to this point about whether there's anything in an exponential random graph model at all. And uh, it, it says it's, uh, it can nest any random graph model and it can incorporate arbitrary interdependencies and connections. Well, then it's not a model. It's just, a it's just an arbitrary descriptive representation. And it reminds me of something, again, going back 40 years. Uh, pr there's probably only one or two other people in this room who may remember what Mother Logit was. OK. So Jim Heckman remembers Mother Logit, because he was there at the time. And Richard Blundell may remember Mother Logit. I don't expect anybody else to. When Dan McFadden was doing the log con conditional Logit model for discrete choice analysis, um, which then he, he really, Dan really loved the, uh, the Logit form. Lots of people loved the sim analytical simplicity of that exponential form. And Dan realized at some point that if instead of having a random utility model where um, the, only the attributes of a particular alternative affect its utility, if you just allowed for everything to go in there, just throw in the kitchen sink, then you could use the Logit form to be a representation of any choice probabilities, period. 
And he called this Mother Logia. He actually wrote a paper on it. He had enough good sense not to publish the paper. Yeah, but <laughs> I still have a copy of it, and, and it's graying or probably turned to dust by now. I haven't looked at it for years. It's in my files. He, Dan called this Mother Logia. Well, it looks like exponential random graphs are just Mother Logia. There's no content to it. It's just a description, OK? So here we, got, here we have the, uh, the model. Uh, there's a statement in the, in the uh, paper that they have become widely used because they provide an intuitive formulation focusing on key structural aspects that researchers believe are important in network formation and that can encode rich types of independencies. I don't understand the sentence because I just said that these things are arbitrary representation of any network. So how, how is it that they focus on key structural aspects and provide an intuitive formulation of anything? I, I just, so this is not about the Chandrasekhar Jackson paper uh, making a comment on the entire literature that uses these things. Okay, now finally, consistency. There's little known about, this is a quote from the paper, about the consistency of the estimates. What were the parameters converged? Would estimated parameters converge to the true parameters as the size of the network grows? If the, what do we mean by true parameters? Before we can talk about estimated parameters converging to true parameters, there has to be something like uh, uh, that we could call true parameters. The only way I can make sense of this is to think of a very, uh, w uh, to specify a well-defined micro, the word micro foundation was used in the talk, but I didn't actually see the micro foundations much in the paper, but to specify a very specific uh, model at the micro level so that there is a fixed set of parameters and then as sample size goes to infinity, or as the number, not sample size, as the number of nodes grows to infinity, then there is a fixed object that we're trying to estimate. So obviously in the time series literature, if you have, if you have an AR1 model, then you obviously have that. If you have a finite dimensional moving average, then you obviously have that. But what is the case here in these network models that's a fixed object? Or is it rather that you have a sequence of objects as the, as the number of nodes goes up? And I think this gets down to the economics of this rather than the uh, statistics, is that I find it hard to think of networks in which the, the process will be, um, uh, in, in which things will stay stable. So if you just think about number of friends, if there's only 30 people in the world, and if I try to think about how many friends I'll have with 30 people, it's one thing. But if I now have millions of people, and if I just base my model on, say, uh, you know, some of these models have uh, people uh, doing random uh, appearances and they're deciding whether to match with one another, would the matching process stay the same as the size grows up, goes up? Okay? I have no idea. Without writing down specific models, you can't tell. Same issue arises in the industrial organization literature as you go from a, a duopoly to a small oligopoly as you go up to perfect competition. Is that basically the structure changes and that it's hard to uh, go on. Okay, so uh, finally, since I'm out of time, um, he, they go on and talk about uh, SERGMs. And I'll, I'll end with this. Um, they propose a generalization of the class of exponential raft models that are called statistical exponential raft models. If an exponential ra random graph model is itself a universal description, then I don't know what a generalization means. Okay? Uh, so this is a quote from the paper. I don't know how you generalize something that's already arbitrarily uh, general. Moreover, quoting again from the paper, that uh, is at the bottom is, is that, that we can define the model in which uh, statistics are generated rather than graphs, and this greatly reduces the dimensionality of the space. If one is generalizing a model rather than putting a restriction on it, I don't understand how this reduces the dimensionality of the space. It seems it's a more general model rather than a restricted model. So, well, I could go on. I have other questions as I went through page by page, but I'm out of time, so I'll stop here.